Peace be to Allah, and blessings and salutations upon His beloved, our beloved and last messenger, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So today is session six in the tafsir of Surah Yaseen. And we got to ayah number 45, 46, and 47. Last week we, we ended with ayah 45. We'll do it again quickly today and we'll continue from there. قال تعالى وإذا قيل لهم اتقوا ما بين أيديكم وما خلفكم لعلكم ترحمون وما تأتيهم من آية من آيات ربهم إلا كانوا عنها معرضين وإذا قيل لهم أنفقوا مما رزقكم الله قال الذين كفروا للذين آمنوا أنطعم من لو يشاء الله أطعمه إن أنتم إلا في ضلال مبين so today, inshallah, we focus on these three ayat. And when they're told, beware what befell those before you and what shall befall you hereafter, that happily you may find mercy. Beware of what lies before and behind you so that you may be given mercy. So last week we went over this ayah very quickly that uh, this ayah is talking about giving us an example, an example of those who disbelieve, an example about what their attitude might be or what their behavior might be, their characters, their human nature. When they're told, when they're given advice, regardless, irrespective of those that give advice. This verb, as we mentioned last time, could have one of two meanings. It could be an emphatic form, i.e., Build a shield, but in an emphatic way. Make sure the shield is really a shield. Protect yourself. Or it could mean تَخِذُوا بِقَيَتًا تَخِذُوا بِقَيَتًا ضَعُوا بِقَيَتًا Establish a shield between you and whatever displeases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. ضَعُوا بِقَيَتًا بَيْنَكُمْ وَبَيْنَ الْعَذَابِ إذا قيل لهم اتقوا ما بين أيديكم ما بين أيديكم it could mean the punishment that has that has taken place before you that has taken place to those nations before you and since it has taken place it's like in front of us we can see it it could also mean the punishment that is yet to come And it is so certain, it's as if we're seeing it today, in front of us. So some commentators um, explained it in the first way, and some commentators explained it in the second way. خَلْفَكُمْ could refer to that which hasn't happened yet, because it's like behind us, we haven't seen it yet. Or it could refer to the past as some, some commentators um, have considered. And the idea is that we sh one should take lessons from, from previous lessons, from lessons that have befallen previous nations. Why? Because there is no difference between you and them, addressing these believers. There is no difference between you and them. So are you unbelievers? Better than those unbelievers before you? Am lakum bara'atun fi zubur? Or have you developed an immunity from 
the ancient inspired volumes of admonishment and wisdom. You're not better than them. You're like them. And if punishment has befallen them, it could also befall you. What's the difference? That's where we stop. Then we ask the question, Aina jawabu iza? Iza qila lahum. When they're told. So where is the consequent of this conditional statement? Where is the main clause? Right? We can say, if you visit me, I will honor you. I will honor you is the main clause. But this main clause is omitted. When they're told, that's the, that's the antecedent. Where is the consequent? Where is the hypothesis? It's omitted. And it's omitted, but it's implied. What do you think is the main clause? The main clause is that they turn away. وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ إِتَّقُوا مَا بَيْنَ أَيْدِيكُمْ وَمَا خَلْفَكُمْ لَعَلَّكُمْ تُرْحَمُونَ what is their reaction? The reaction is they turn away. They show their aversion to what they're told. They show their aversion to anything that they hear. And their aversion is not mentioned in the ayah. But the next verse automatically proves their aversion. So the aversion that the disbelievers display in the first verse is omitted because the next verse is showing it. So in accordance with the syntax of the Arabic language, the hypothesis or the principal clause of the conditional statement is a qiladahum, when they're told, when it is said to them, it, it was suppressed, it was omitted. Why? But the word of the next verse clarifies it. So it's omitted and the next verse is alluding to it. And what is that? What is that main clause? It's Iraq. They turn away. They show their aversion. They turn their back upon something. They turn away from it. They avoid it. They shun it. They don't want to hear these things. And Arad is omitted in the first verse because the next verse is more encompassing, is more general. Because the next verse says, وَمَا تَأْتِيهِمْ مِنْ آيَةٍ إِلَّا كَانُوا عَنْهَا مُعْرِضِينَ Nor does a single ayah reach them of all the ayat of their Lord, saved from it are they turned away. So this, this ayah, this next ayah, ayah number 46, they turn away from it, is more general in terms of scope. I.e., it's not just that they turn away because they're told something. No. Their constant state is turning away. So, the idea here is that they magnify themselves. They behave too proudly. They boast a quality that they do not possess. So they magnify themselves against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by refusing to accept the truth. But in a very general way, and here we, we notice something, that turning away is, is one thing and not noticing something is a different thing. It's not that they do not notice, no, they turn away. Because if one does not notice or one is not paying attention to what's being said to them, وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ إِتَّقُوا مَا بَيْنَ أَيْدِيكُمْ Perhaps they weren't paying attention. That's fine. But uh, if one is not paying attention, 
one could have an excuse. However, if someone turns away, that indicates another quality in them, which is arrogance. Indicates arrogance. They see and they turn away. They hear and they turn away. No, no, they're paying attention. But they, they think of themselves as they're too high to, um, to have these words addressed to them. And they turn away from even listening. Yes, They don't want to listen. So therefore, What was their answer? What was their reaction? Is turn away. Why? Because Why? Because they are mustakbirun. Because they have arrogance in their heart and they have pride in their heart. And they're too proud to admit it. And then we asked the question last time is this world, what is that? This world. What does it mean? Because in Arabic, as you know, there are no punctuation rules like we have in English. We have a dot and a comma and a semicolon and a colon. In Arabic, all of that is taken care of with the wow. The wow takes care of everything. And it's not an easy letter to uh, interpret. That's why the ulama of usul of jurisprudence, they spend a lot of time talking about the wow and the possible meanings of the world. So, here, uh, this world, what is it indicating? It's indicating one of two things. So either this world is to indicate their state, or this world is a world of contrast, contrasting something with something else. And to Understand this well, we need to go back to ayah number 28. So we need to understand or try to appreciate how the Quran uh, addresses issues and how the Quran teaches us to uh, uh, understand what it's saying. So this wow is a wow of atof, is a wow of conjunction. So if we start with the ayah, This is immediately after the story of Ashab al -Qariyah. And then it says, Alam kam ahlakna qablahum In ayah 31, admonishing them. In ayah number 32, Wa in kullun lamma jami'un ladayna muhtarun i.e. you're going to bat. To go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Again, it's admonishing them and reminding them that there is an end, there is a resurrection, there is a day, there is a hereafter. <coughs> and then it started listening the ayat. وَآيَةٌ لَهُمُ الْأَرْضُ الْمَيْتَةُ And then the next verse. وَآيَةٌ لَهُمُ اللَّيْلُ نَسْلَقُ مِنْهُ النَّهَارُ وَالشَّمْسُ تَجْرِي لِمُسْتَقَرِ لَهَا وَآيَةٌ لَهُمُ الْفُلْكُ Many signs of Allah. So then the wow comes. So we have given them many ayat. And we have reminded them and admonishing them that this life is not the end. There is next life. There is another life. The question is, did they benefit from these ayat? Did they benefit from this admonition? No, they did not benefit from this ayat. Not only this, but when, when they're told, ittaqu ma bayna idikum wa ma khalfakum a'rab. Not only they did not benefit, and when they're reminded, ittaqu, when they're given advice, ittaqu ma bayna idikum wa ma khalfakum, they turn away and they show their aversion, out of arrogance and out of pride. That's another meaning of the of the wow. The second meaning of the wow is a wow of contrast. 
So in the Quran, for example, we hear the ayah, Ya ayyuha al-nasu taqu rabbakum, inna zalzalat al-sayati shay'un azim. And it keeps on talking about the akhirah and, and what, what happens in the hereafter and how terrifying the hereafter can be for some people. And then it says, وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يُجَادِلُ And it says, وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يُجَادِلُ It's like this is the law of contrast. We're talking about the akhirah and look at those people. They're spending their time in argumentation and and denial. هَذَا حَالُهُمْ حَالُ الْأَخِرَةِ is this and this and this. This is the state of the akhirah. This is what's going to take place in the akhirah. But what is their state? Their state is bickering and arguing with each other and not paying attention to the hereafter. Contrasting what happens on the Day of Judgment with their state in this life. It's like when you tell someone, I am good to you and you're bad to me. You're contrasting what you do to them with what they do to you. It's a law of contrast. What is aqila lahum? Look what happened before and look what what's happening now. Contrasting of what is before is what is after the war. There's before the war and after the war. So wa iza qila lahum ittaqu ma bayna aydikum wa ma khalfakum la'allakum turhamun. Wa ma ta'tihim min ayatin min ayat rabbihim illa kanu anha mu'ridin. ما تأتيهم من آية من آيات ربهم إلا كانوا عنها معرضين. So the disbelievers pay no heed and they show their aversion. They they show their strong dislike. And آية number six is explicating all this. وما تأتيهم من آية من آيات ربهم إلا كانوا عنها مرضين. And it's showing also how emphatic the reaction is. So the آية begins by the word ما. And ما is different than لا. We say لا تأتيهم من آية ما تأتيهم من آية. It's different than لم. You know the word لم when you say لم يلد ولم يولد. لم. Lam implies the past. La implies the future. In implies the future. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not say la ta'tihim min ayatin, i.e. in the future when ayat comes, yu'ridu'anha, they will turn away from it. And not the past, that ayat came to them and a'radu'anha. It says, wa ma, ma i.e. it's occurring. It has occurred. It has taken place. It's not in the future. And it's not just one or two ayah that came in the past. It's occurring. And then it follows that with the verb that indicates it's a verb mudara. It's not the past tense, it's not the future tense, it's the present tense. وَمَا تَأْتِيهِمْ مِنْ آيَةٍ And the implication of using the verb in the present tense, this particular verb in Arabic, implies tajadud, implies repetition, implies perpetuity. So, ma ta'tihim, always, there is always a present tense. From eternity to eternity, there is always a present tense. There is a now. The past used to be a now, at some point in time. Now is a now, today. And tomorrow is a now, when we reach tomorrow. Wa ma ta'tihim, wa ma ta'tihim. So, this has already occurred, and it's, it's perpetual. Min ayatim. Min ayatim. It's like the ayah comes to them. The ayah is coming to them. The ayah loves them. The ayah loves to remind them. The ayah loves that they take lesson from it and accept the truth. It's like the ayah is in a love relationship with them. Yet they turn away. وَمَا تَأْتِيهِمْ مِنْ آيَةٍ And not any ayah. مِنْ آيَاتِ رَبِّهِمْ From the ayat of their Lord. And the word used here, Rabb, not Allah, not 
uh, Al-Jabbar, not Al-Aziz, not Al-Qawi, Rabb, Rabb the one that nurtures and takes care of things until they reach the Kamal, perfection. إِلَّا كَانُوا عَنْهَا مُعْرِضِينَ So in Arabic, إِلَّا كَانُوا عَنْهَا مُعْرِضِينَ indicates their state. إِلَّا كَانُوا عَنْهَا مُعْرِضِينَ وَمَا تَعْتِيهِمْ مِنْ آيَةٍ مِنْ آيَاتِ رَبِّهِمْ إِلَّا كَانُوا عَنْهَا مُعْرِضِينَ Nor does a single sign, a single ayah reach them of all the ayat, of all the signs of their Lord, safe from it are they turned away. Indicating the state of the disbelievers when the ayat come to them. What's the implication here? What do you think is the implication? When I tell you, when I say to you, when somebody comes to you, smiling. So when they came, they were smiling in the state of smiling. What's the implication? The implication is that it's concurrent. It's at the same time. I came to you, smiling. You came to me, smiling. I came to you, frowning. You came to me, frowning. It's happening at the same time. It's not after, it's not before. I.e., مَا تَعْتِيهِمْ مِنْ آيَةِ مَا تَعْتِيهِمْ مِنْ آيَةِ مِنْ آيَةِ رَبِّهِمْ إِلَّا كَانُوا عَنْهَا مُعْرِضِينَ I.e., this is their state. The state is, is taking place at the same time as the ayah comes to them. <laughs> did not say Aradu, did not say Mata'atiyin min ayat min ayat rabbihim, and then they turn away. No, illa kanu anha mu'ridi. Illa kanu anha mu'ridi. This is their state. The state, their state is, they're so stubborn and so arrogant that they had the second nature of Arab. They turn away from the truth. Is Allah SWT referring to any nation or the, during the time of Rasulullah This is a general area that, that refers to uh, the reaction of many people who have this kind of attitude. Now, of course, the example is, uh, is something that we see at the time of the Prophet but this is not something specific to the time of the Prophet. It, we, we, we see this today. Yeah. We see it you know, all over the place. There are some people who are, uh, who are immersed in their arrogance to the point that they're, they're not even willing to listen. And if, if they were to be reminded of something, their state is turning away even before this. So when you admonish them, that's going to be their state. It's taking place at the same time. It's like when you see Niagara Falls. Sometimes you see Niagara Falls, you say, cute. Some other people may react differently. They say, wow. Some people may say, subhanallah. And some people may say, subhanallah, whether they see Niagara Falls or not. They're always saying, subhanallah. That's their state. Their state is subhanallah. Always magnifying Allah. These guys, the opposite. Their state is turning away. Whether they hear an ayah or not. So when an ayah comes to them, it's coming to them while they are in that state. Showing that they are not even ready to, to hear it and accept it. So it's not, it won't benefit them. They've been veiled from it. Their state has reached its threshold, has, has reached a certain point that um, they can no longer benefit from these things. And they've been veiled from these ayat. Any question before we go to the next ayat? Just a quick question, okay. a clarification about the, the illa. I understand, I mean, it has that element of exception, like, Yes. So this actually, this is this is a good question because this doesn't include does doesn't imply generality and encompassing, but this form of exclusion implies. 
Like no ayah comes to them except they are in the state. Regardless of the ayah. Had Illa not been there, it could have been maybe some ayat, but not others. No. Any ayat. But, but it's referring to the ayat, not to the people. Meaning that it's, it's any, any ayat, this is going to be the response, as opposed to any people with this quality will have this response. Yeah, here it's referring to the ayat. No. The ayat. Not the ayat. ayat in Illa. Illa. No. طيب. The next ayah says وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ أَنْفِقُوا مِمَّا رَزَقَكُمُ اللَّهُ قَالَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَنُطْعِمُ مَنْ لَوْ يَشَاءُ اللَّهُ أَطْعَمَ إِنْ أَنْتُمْ إِلَّا فِي ضَلَالِ مُبِي Ayah number 47 And when they are told expand, expand of what Allah has provided you when, it's, when it is said unto them, the spend of that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you and has provided you. Those who disbelieve say to those who believe, should we feed whom had Allah wished, he had fed them. None of you are except lost plain astray. The disbelievers will say to those who believe, are we to feed those whom, if God willed, if Allah willed, He would have fed them? You are not but in, a, in manifest error. Now, in this area, we have, there are a few things that we should focus on. And the first question we want to ask is, in antum illa fi dalalin mubin, none of you are except lost plain astray. Who is saying that? We have three possibilities, and we'll take two of them. We'll focus on two of them. So either this disbelievers are telling, are saying this to the believers, or it's Allah subhanahu wa taala who's saying this to them, or the believers are saying this to this disbelievers. So we'll take two possibilities. The first possibility is disbelievers are saying this to the believers. The second possibility is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is commenting on their saying by saying in antum illa fi So we'll take a look at these two possibilities. So wa iza qila lam anfiqu mimma razaqakum Allah. Iza qila lam أَنْفِقُوا مِمَّا رَزَقَكُمُ اللَّهِ قَالَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَنُطْعِمُوا مَنْ لَوْ يَشَاءُ اللَّهُ أَطْعَمَ Those who disbelieve say to those who believe Are we, feed, are we to feed those whom of, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will He would have fed them That's their argument. When they're told, spend something, they say, are we to feed those whom Allah, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wished to feed them? He could have done so. When we talk about the religion or deen, we can summarize deen in two things. You can say deen is ihsanun ma'al, ma'al haq and ihsanun ma'al khalq. Deen is excellence. Excellence when you behave, when, when you deal with the creator, and excellence when you deal with the creation. That's the essence of deen. Dealing with the creator in the most excellent way. Dealing with the creation in the most excellent way. So in the Quran we always we see Aqamu Salah wa Aatu Zakat. Aqamu Salah with the Creator. Wa Aatu Zakat with the creation. So the ayah here is showing us that these guys are the worst. When they deal with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they're at their worst. They don't believe in Him. And even when they deal with the creation, they're at their worst. 
they want to they don't want to give anything to the creation so they have no mercy and no compassion for the uh, creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they have no taqwa because deen in essence is to ta'zim uh, al is to reveal the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to have compassion on the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that's in essence and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is showing us here the nature of those who believe and the nature of those who disbelieve and making a contrast. And there is now a dialogue between two groups, two parties. Those who disbelieve say to those who believe. So there is a dialogue between the believers and the disbelievers. And the believers are telling the disbelievers, Allah gave you wealth. Allah gave us everything. And Allah provided us with many blessings. To so spend some of the things that Allah SWT has provided you with on those who need it. What was their reaction and what was their response? They were asked to spend. What was their response? Are we to feed? Are we to feed? The believers ask them to spend. This is more general. Not just to feed, to spend. The disbelievers say, are we to feed? So when you say, when you tell somebody, why don't you give him a hundred dollars? You say, not even a penny. The believers say, spend from what Allah Taala has provided for you on those who need. The disbelievers say, not even a penny. Not even food and the disbelievers are are saying this this is what we want to explore what is their state what's going on in their mind and why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mention قال الذين كفروا i.e. this is the saying of the disbelievers what's the implication here the implication that the believers cannot be like them وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ اِتَّقُوا مَا بَيْنَ عِدِيكُمْ وَمَا خَلْفَكُمْ لَعَلَّكُمْ تُرْحَمُونَ وَمَا تَأْتِيهِمْ مِنْ آيَةٍ مِنْ آيَاتِ رَبِّهِمْ إِلَّا كَانُوا عَنْهَا مُعْرِدِينَ That's the response. I.e. the response of the believers should be the opposite. Same thing here. وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ أَنْفِقُوا مِمَّا عَزَقَكُمُ اللَّهُ قَالَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا And here, الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا not those who have PhD in Kufr, but those who are kafirun, whether they are uh, any kinds of kafirs. Qala lazina kafiru li lazina ama. Their response is, well, come here. You believers, come here. We're going to teach you your religion. You say everything is in the hand of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everything is under God's will. There are those people whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala willed for them to be poor. Why should I change the will of Allah? You want me to change the will of Allah? You, believers, say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provided wealth for X and deprived wealth from Y. If what you're saying is true, why should I change something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decreed? Had God will, he could have given him. But since he didn't give him, why should I give it to him? Hmm? And that's, that's the response. Now this response is not specific to them. This response, we hear it all the time. We hear it too, especially from stingy people. And they can be Muslims, they can be. But then when they say this, they are behaving like those guys. Alaikum. Alaikum So, you have me. Now, of course, this, the response of the disbelievers here 
is coming from um, what angle? The angle of sarcasm. Mimma Rasakakumullah. It's like they're telling them, you believers, you are lost. We're going to teach you your religion. We are going to teach you. Why do you want to change the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? You don't understand your own religion. We are going to teach you. Now, of course, this is like they're mocking them. They're, they're saying this out of sarcasm. And behind the sarcasm, there is arrogance. There is arrogance and pride. And then they say, in antum illa fi be. You believers are but in a manifest error. Because you don't even understand your own religion. And this is an argument that they use also in other verses in the Quran. Because they said, Law Allah ma ashakna. Had Allah willed, we wouldn't be mushriks. But since He wants, He willed for us to be mushriks, we're mushriks. Law Allah ma ashakna. So, what is the answer to this? Or, irrespective of the reaction of the disbelievers, what is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala telling us in this ayah? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us in many ayat that وَجَعَلْنَا بَعْضَكُمْ لِبَعْضٍ فِتْنَةٍ أَتَصْبِرُونَ That we have made some of you a means of testing others. أَتَصْبِرُونَ Will you stand fast? وَكَانَ رَبُّكَ بَصِيرًا this is a test. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us in different places, different times, gave us different qualities, different means, different capabilities. Some of us are tall, some of us are short, some of us are smart, some of us are, um, uh, are have developed a skill in in, in the particular. Some of us are good at carpentry, some of us are good you know, at doing other things. Some of us are not as wealthy as others. Some of us are more wealthy than others. And Allah SWT made people a test for others. As for the poor, He made the, the poor people a test for those who have wealth and made the people who have wealth as a test for those who are poor. And this group is mukallaf to pass the test. And the other group is also mukallaf to pass the test. We're all under the responsibility and accountability to pass the test. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for example, made some people wealthy, alhamdulillah. And not only that, He created us in a way that we love money, we love wealth. That mankind, they love khayr. Khayr here means money and wealth. They have tremendous love for us. So this is like part of our fitrah, that we love wealth, we love. And then the Quran it says, Although human souls are prone to selfishness and stinginess. And then at the same time, Allah SWT told us, أَنْفِقُوا مِنْ طَيِّبَاتِ مَا كَسَبْتُمْ وَبِمَّا أَخْرَجْنَا لَكُمْ مِنَ الْأَرْضِ وَلَا تَيَمَّمُوا الْخَبِيثَ مِنْهُمْ تُنْفِقُونَ وَلَسْتُمْ بِآخِذِينَ بِآخِذِيهِ إِلَّا أَنْ تُغْمِدُوا فِيهِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says أَنْفِقُوا مِنْ طَيِّبَاتِ مَا كَسَبْتُمْ So give charitably from the good things you have acquired and you have earned وَمِمَّا أَخْرَجْنَا لَكُمْ مِنَ الْأَرْضِ And that we have produced for you from the earth. وَلَا تَيَمَّمُوا الْخَبِيثَ مِنْهُ تُنْفِقُونَ And do not seek to give the bad things. 
Because sometimes I hear that the mosque needs carpet. I have an old carpet in my house. I said, I'll give it to the mosque. I don't give to the mosque something that's new. Because I say, no. And if you pull me in tayyibat, you might accept it. Give. In the Quran it says, لَن تَنَالُ الْبِرَّ حَتَّى تُنْفِقُوا مِنْ مَا تُحِبُّونَ you will not achieve righteousness and birth unless you spend of that which you love the most. That's, that's a test. Some people are tried with poverty, others are tried with wealth. And the poor are commanded to pass the test. The wealthy also are commanded to pass the test. The poor are commanded to pass the test by being patient and by not humiliating themselves. And the wealthy are commanded to pass the test by giving and by caring and by showing compassion for other people. That's the nature of test. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave me wealth and made it beloved to me and then told me, spend from it. Spend from that which you love. And now imagine, imagine that there are no poor and we're all wealthy. Imagine a situation where the earth has no poor people in it. So the only group in the earth are those that are wealthy. I it's like we're all in paradise. There is no paradise on earth. Then this command to give the to take, for the, to take care of the poor and, and give the poor will have no meaning, becomes meaningless. Because I look around me and everybody else is wealthy. They don't need me. And then I can, I can tell Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Oh Allah, I, I wanted to obey you and I wanted to fulfill your command. But there is no need. Everybody is wealthy. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made other people poor so that the test will have meaning. So being poor is, is a test for those who are wealthy. Being stingy is a test for our nature. And at the same time, the poor, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded him to have patience and commanded him to have ta'afuf and commanded him not to ask. And then told everybody else on the tongue of the Prophet The Prophet says, the upper hand is better than the lower hand. And if he, if everybody was, was wealthy and everybody was, you know, had money, and, and you tell the command came to be a thief, and Ta'afuf, I said, what's the value? What's the meaning of this? There is no meaning. There is no meaning for Zuhud and for Ifa unless there is some poverty. Unless he sees a wealthy group in front of them and says, Allah gave those people and did not give me. So what is he commanded? We are all commanded to accept the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَعَسَى أَن تَكْرَهُ شَيْئًا وَهُوَ خَيْرٌ لَكُمْ and they're commanded not to ask as far as they could sometimes you have to ask but in, in principle the poor are not commanded not to ask sometimes hunger is very hard to recognize some people don't show you that they're hungry some people, they don't show you that they're needy, that they're in need. Some people don't show you that they are in deficit. And that's the test. The wealthy are commanded to be proactive and to look for those who are in need before they're put in a position that they have to ask. And commanded us to give to them. And vice versa. At the same time, the poor is commanded not to ask. 
and to keep their dignity. And if you look at them, you think they're not poor. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ba'dakum li ba'dim fitna atasbibun that we have made some of you as a means of testing others. So some of us are prophets. We are not prophets. Some of us are kings. We are not kings. Some of us are princes. We are not princes. Some of us are billionaires. We are not billionaires. Some of us are whatever. They have this quality. I don't have it. Atasbiru, will you stand fast? This is a test. Not to have envy of others. And this balance between the rich and the wealthy, between the wealthy and the poor, it, it promotes cooperation between society. It's like zakat, for example. Zakat is like, uh, at the end, when the poor knows that, that there is a percentage that is his right, their right, amongst the wealth of the rich, they're not going to envy the wealth. The wealth is too much. Why? Because it's like those who are rich are working for them at the end. Because they have to give them at least 2.5% or more. وَجَعَلْنَا بَعْضَكُمْ لِبَعْضٍ فِتْنَةٍ Now this is the response to those who, who say this. أَنُطْعِمُ مَنْ لَوْ يَشَاءُ اللَّهُ أَطْعَمَهُ إِنْ أَنْتُمْ إِلَّا فِي ضُلَاءِ الْمُبِينَ Now of course they're not talking from their intellect. But they're talking from, from an angle of sarcasm, an angle of like, mocking, driven by arrogance. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is now, uh, uh, this will take us to another point. The point is, why are we here on earth? If, and the purpose of the surah is to talk about the resurrection and the hereafter. Why are we here on earth? Are we here on earth only in this life and there is no other life beyond this life? Are we completely free? We can do whatever we wish? No, we have a responsibility. We have an accountability. As I say, with great power comes great responsibility. No, with the great Allah created us in a way and gave us a mission. And this mission is our responsibility. And if the mission was easy, it's like drinking water. What's the meaning of a mission like this? When you work in a company, or when you work for the government, or you work to do something, there are always obstacles that you have to overcome, and projects you have to accomplish. Projects are not easy. If they're easy, anybody can do them. And if the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are easy, like drinking water, then they, they become meaningless. Because the idea also is to show our servitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To manifest that I am a servant, I am a slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That I need of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this will be manifested when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give me give uh, when Allah gives me a mission and and I I exert my effort into accomplishing this mission. And I say, Your wish is my command. So the disbelievers in their sarcastic response, you say, they tell the believers, you say that Allah is the provider and sustainer of the entire creation. Yeah, well, he did not give them anything. So why should we? And as for your words of advice that we should provide for them, this is nothing but that you have gone astray. Do you want to make us the provider for them? Allah is the provider. Why should I become the provider? Do you want us to be the, the Razak 
Allah is the one who gives us it, as you say. Now, of course, this um, shows that they're not saying this, you know, just to argue. They're saying this out of sarcasm. They are mocking the believers. But the ayah is telling us here something, that these guys have lost two things, have lost Iman and have lost the humanity. Because their disbelievers yet, they were advised to give to those who are in need. Not because you believe or disbelieve, but because they are in need. So, this ayah is telling us that some people are not even willing to show compassion to other creation. And as such, their humanity is, has degraded. So they have no Iman and no humanity. And what's the difference between us and beasts? If Iman is not there, and we have no humanity, and we don't care about anybody else except me, me, me. Verse number 47 says, وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ أَنْفِقُوا مِمَّا رَزَقَكُمُ اللَّهُ قَالَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَنُطْعِمُوا مَنْ لَوْ يَشَاءُ اللَّهُ أَطْعَمَهُ إِنْ أَنْتُمْ إِلَّا فِي ضَلَالِ مُبِينَ and notice the word that is used here in the beginning is إِذَا وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ إِتَّقُوا مَا بَيْنَ أَيْدِيكُمْ وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ أَنْفِقُوا مِنْ مَا رَزَقَكُمْ The word إِذَا And the word إِذَا in Arabic implies highly likelihood. Implies that this is most likely this will be their response. And also implies in many cases certitude that guaranteed this will be the response. The response of those who are disbelievers will be, The word إِذَا is used, like, إِذَا جَاءَ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحِ Why? Because guaranteed this is going to happen. The word in means less likely. The word إِذَا is more likely up to 100%, up to certainty. وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ أَنْفِقُوا مِمَّا رَزَقَكُمُ اللَّهُ قَالَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَنُطْعِمُوا مَنْ لَوْ يَشَاءُ اللَّهُ أَطْعَمَا إِنْ أَنْتُمْ إِلَّا فِي ضُلَالِ مُبِينَ So we said, إِنْ أَنْتُمْ إِلَّا فِي ضُلَالِ مُبِينَ This comment could be the saying of the disbelievers. Could also be the saying of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to them. And what would be the meaning if it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala telling them this? In antum illa fi dalalim mubin. What do you think is the meaning? Any thoughts? Any idea? This brings us to a pedagogical point. This is something we see in the seerah of the Prophet and we see in the Quran. And it's teaching us a principle. The Prophet taught his companions, taught his generation, taught those that believed in him, those that witnessed his message, and taught us all by extension. And the way he taught those that believe in him, that when they make a mistake, he would count on their mistakes. And the comment of the Prophet والسلام, on, their mistake, on their mistake is always proportional to the seriousness of the mistake. So when they do something good, he would give them a credit and approve either explicitly or 
implicitly by remaining silent. Because the Prophet والسلام, would never approve falsehood. Sometimes they may make a mistake. And والسلام, would stand on the member and admonish everybody. Because the mistake is slight and it can happen from anyone. Sometimes the mistake is in such a way that um, the comment from the Prophet comes in a way that's telling us that I did not expect this from him. When he commented about something Abu Zagar Rifari did, the ulama understood from his comment that this was not something expected. I expected more from you. This mistake should not have happened from you, Abu Zagar, because you are in my sight, more knowledgeable and should not have fallen this mistake. When some companions, they were on a journey and, and somebody was in the state of Geneva and it was very, very cold. In the morning, he asked them, do you see, can you find Rufus for me? Can you find dispensation? They said, we don't find a dispensation that if you're you only see that if you if you're in the state of Geneva, you have to make ghusl. So he took a bath, he made ghusl, and he died as a result. Ali Sallallahu commented on their advice and their fatwa by saying, "Qataluhu," they killed him. Allah. May God fight him, or uh, that's a serious mistake. It's not an easy mistake. When Usama bin Zayd and in one of the battles uh, he was about to kill a disbeliever um, and the disbeliever says, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. He had a doctor. The Prophet told him, killed him after he said la ilaha illallah. He said, Ya Rasulullah, he only killed it, said it because I was about to kill him. He said, you killed him after he said, La ilaha illallah. And then Usama kept saying, he kept repeating this until I wished that I became Muslim today. The same way. Because that mistake is a grave mistake, is a serious mistake. And this is a prophetic methodology of teaching us. This is his methodology of education. But this methodology is in the Quran. So always, like many, often we talk about like what is the prophetic methodology of education, of teaching. We should also talk about what is the divine methodology of teaching, Quranic methodology of teaching. And we see it also in the Quran. In the Quran, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala quotes the disbelievers, there's always a comment. And the comment is depending on the extent of the mistake and the seriousness of their sin. So, for example, In Surah Al-An'am, verse 136, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, The disbelievers dedicated and they dedicate to Allah a share of the crops and cattle He created saying, this belongs to God, and this belongs to our partners, i.e. the idols. That's what they said. Did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala remain silent? Did the Quran remain silent? He said, وَجَعَلُوا لِلَّهِ مِمَّا زَرَعَ مِنَ الْحَرْسِ وَالْأَنْعَامِ نَصِبًا فَقَالُوا هَذَا لِلَّهِ Immediately the Quran commented, بِزَعْمِ So they claim. Or so they claim. 
because their plan is whatever they dedicate to Allah, their idols can benefit from it. And whenever they dedicate for their idols, Allah has no share. That's how they design their dedication. But immediately, and then he says, سَاءَمَا يَحْكُمُونَ Immediately he said, بِزَعْمِهِمْ Or so they claim. And then at the end commented, سَاءَمَا يَحْكُمُونَ Evil indeed is the judgment they make. Sometimes they say something very, very serious. And we see this in many surahs. We see it in Surah Al-Baqarah. We see it in Surah to Yunus alayhi salam, chapter 10. We see it in Surah Maryam alayhi salam. قَالُوا اتَّخَذَ اللَّهُ وَلَدًا They say Allah has taken a child. This Quran remains silent. When the disbelievers say this, قَالُوا اتَّخَذَ اللَّهُ وَلَدًا they say Allah has taken a child. Immediately the Quran says, Subhanallah. Subhanallah. Glory be to him. بَلْ لَهُ مَا فِي السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ كُلُّ لَهُ قَانِتُونَ In Surah Al-Baqarah. No, everything in the heaven and the earth belongs to him. In Surah Yunus, it says the same thing. قَالُوا اتَّخَذَ اللَّهُ وَلَدًا they say Allah has taken a child. Immediately the Quran says, Subhana, glory be to him. Huwa al ghani He is self sufficient. Why does he need a woman? Lahu ma fi samawati wa ma fi al-ard. He is self sufficient. Unto him belongs whatsoever is in the heavens and whatsoever is on the earth. You have no authority for this. In indakum min sultan in bihazam. Do you have any authority to say this? Do you have any proof? أَتَقُولُونَ عَلَى اللَّهِ مَا لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Do you say about God that which you, you know not? And then it, at the end it says قُلْ إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يَفْتَرُونَ عَلَى اللَّهِ الْكَذِبَ لَا يُفْلِحُونَ Say, i.e. O Muhammad, surely those who fabricate a lie against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not prosper. لا يُفْلِحُونَ in Surah Maryam, the same thing happens. And they say the compassionate has taken a child. Did the Quran remain silent? And went on and on. And they say the compassionate has taken a child. You have indeed asserted a terrible thing. The heavens are well nigh rendered by, and the earth split asunder, and the mountains made to fall down in ruins because of the severity of this, of this claim. That they should claim for the compassionate a child. It is not fitting for the compassionate to take a child. It's inconceivable. It's absurd. So when the when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala quotes this, the disbelievers as saying something, when he mentions something about the disbelievers, it's always followed by a comment appropriate for the claim that matches the claim. If the claim is minor, the, the comment is minor. And if the mistake is major, the comment is measured. Because this is teaching us. Sometimes we, like students or, or, or children, maybe make, make mistakes and we erupt. Our, our comment is not proportional to the severity of the mistake. And sometimes someone may make a mistake in front of us and it's so serious. Yet, our reaction is so small. But this shows a problem in us. In Surah Al-Kahf, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about the 
companions of the cave, those that, that went and slept for over 300 years. In Surah Al-Kahf, verse 22, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, سَيَقُولُونَ سَلَاسَةٌ رَابِعُهُمْ كَلْبُونَ وَيَقُولُونَ خَمْسَةٌ سَادِسُهُمْ كَلْبُونَ and then he commented right away, Rajman bil Ghaib. They shall say there were three, and their fourth was a dog. Because people started arguing how many went into this sleep. Some say three, and the dog was their fourth. Some say four, and the dog was their five. Then the Quran commented right away. It says, This is like casting blindly about at what they know not. They're talking about the unseen as if they've seen it. And then it says, And they shall say, There were seven, and the eight of them was their dog. Say, My Lord knows best their number. Did not comment. And Ibn Abbas says, only few people know the number, and I am those of those few people. Because Ibn Abbas, after reading the Quran, noticed this principle. Whatever Allah SWT is silent about, is true, it cannot be false. Whenever there is a mistake or a claim that, that, um, uh, that has a mistake in it, whether it's serious or not serious, there is always a comment that is proportionate to the severity and the seriousness of the mistake of the thing. So he said, there are seven, and there are eight in the dog. Ibn Abbas And that's something we see in the Quran. Here, we see the same thing. وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ أَنْفِقُوا مما رزقكم الله قال الذين كفروا أن أطعم من لو يشاء الله أطعم إن أنتم إلا في ضلال مبين قالوا أن أطعم من لو يشاء الله أطعم That's what they're saying That's their claim So that's their argument Is their argument correct or wrong? It's not correct So the comment now has to come to correct where is the mistake in the argument? Is the mistake in the wording? The wording is correct. Where is the mistake? The mistake is in the argument. Because they're arguing that they're arguing using Allah's powers and will to say that the maqdur, those should not, should be, you know, should not give them anything. So this is kalima to haqqin, what we say, kalima to haqqin u'idha biha bautin. So where is the problem then? The problem is in them. In antum illa fi dalal al The problem is in them. Not in the argument itself. Because it's true if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wished, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Had he willed, he would have made all of you believers. But technically speaking, these words are true. But they're using it in a sarcastic way, in an arrogant way, showing their nature. So the problem is in them, not in the words. In antum illa fi. In antum illa. This is another form, exclusive form. In antum, antum is jumla ismiya, adulu ala sabud. This is like settled in you. Illa fi dalal mubi. Not ala. Because usually when Allah talks about truth, truth is always ala. Truth is high. When one talks about falsehood or dalal or misguidance, the word that is used is always fee. Fee is like there is an immersion. 
you're, you're immersed in dalal. In antum illa fi dalal. And this dalal is mudin, is clear by itself. So here is the comment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to their claim and to their argument is that you know we're not gonna argue your words because the problem is in you. So it's teaching us how to spot because uh, if you were to argue the words, it will be uh, you won't get anywhere. You need to understand where they're coming from. Where is the root the root disease, the root cause of their saying? Because most time, most often, that is not what, it's not the words. There's always what goes on behind the words. It's not what people say. You, say, you ask somebody, how are you today? I'm fine. But are they really fine? You need to get to what's behind the words, behind the scenes. And the same thing here. قالوا أن نطعم من لو يشاء الله أطعم. ما دام تيجي يا رجل، يضم نا يا رجل، ما دام تيجي تي. بعض الأمور تامز إن دم. طيب، إن شاء الله لا تستوب هي وصل الله على سيدنا محمد. Any questions? سيدي، I have to. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's fine. So I have two questions. One is for the story of the Prophet. What is the story behind the Prophet ﷺ expected more from? Oh, the story he gives them, uh, Prophet ﷺ, Abu Zar was given a number of sheep to, to act as a shepherd. And so he used to take them to the desert. And, so, and then one day, one day Abu Zar ﷺ fell in the state of Janaba. And there was no water. So he, he remained like for, I think, five days without prayer. Without praying. And then he came back. That's so when, when he came back, Prophet we told him the story. He said, I Rasulullah, I, I was in the state of Janabah and I was not able to pray. So I stayed without praying for five, for five days. And the Prophet told him, it was sufficient for you to make the ilmah. <laughs> I.e., like someone like you should know this. The comment was slight. And sometimes he wouldn't comment at all. When, when he told people, He said, None of you should pray, because he sent them on a mission. He said, None of you should pray Asr until, unless you reach Bani Qurayza, unless you reach this place. The tribe of Banu Qurayza, it's a Jewish tribe. So then people left. Um, so they wanted them to hurry so that they reach there before Maghrib so that they can pray Asr in Banu Qurayza. What happened is some of them got delayed. And Asr time was about to, uh, to, to finish, to end. They said, well, Prophet ﷺ told us not to pray Asr except in Bani Qurayza, but the sun is about to set. We can't miss Asr. So they prayed Asr before reaching Bani Qurayza. And others said, no, we're, gonna, we're not going to pray Asr until we reach Bani Qurayza. So they did. So when they came back, they told the Prophet ﷺ what they did. And he did not comment that you're mistaken, you're correct. Both were correct. That's another thing that the Ulama of Usul talk about. Uh, sometimes we think that everything is black and white. The contrast between black and white. And, and that may be true in some cases. So in, in, in matters of what they call aqliyat or usul or fundamentals, we have truth and falsehood, haqq and batil. But in matters of details, Faroor and Fatah and these things, we don't have truth and falsehood. We don't say this is truth and this is a falsehood. We say sawab wa khatab. This is correct and this is incorrect. That's the word we use in Fatah. And the sawab and the khatab. 
And sometimes the contrast is, is, is between what's correct and what's more correct. Or between what's wrong and what's more wrong. So the ulama understand these things. And the fuqaha and mujtahidun, when they deduce laws, and they discover the ahkam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they have all this in mind. Unfortunately, some of us today who are not acquainted with um, the Sharia and the, the rich tradition that we have, um, they think that everything, like things are binary, is in black and white. Hmm. While this may be true in some cases, but not in others. It cannot be generalized. It's true in Aqaid. Through in Aqliyah, in Usul al Deen, in the fundamentals of Usul al Deen, and the fundamentals of things. But not in the details. The details, there could be multiplicity. Any other question or comment? Does that answer your question? Yeah, same. Okay. I have one more. For the, uh, this is more uh, for the parenting question, probably, Sayyidi. Uh, so when you say, um, if you, we see our, uh, the context of uh, severe or non-severe, mm -hmm. the reaction towards like correcting or not correcting is also needs to be appropriate. If it is a grave thing, you need to be severely mm -hmm. commenting. Otherwise, if it is light, uh, you should not be overreacting. So it's a question for the parents. If parents are not reacting appropriately for the kids, so the brought up for the kids would be reverse. How that will be? Sorry, what the question? A question for if a kid, when parents are reacting to the action of kids, like kids are behaving something like, it's a not a grave mistake, but parents are overreacting towards it, like very strongly opposing or unnecessary. So will that be a negative brought up for the kids? Um, but this can happen. Huh? Sometimes parents are passionate about their children. They love their children. And when they see them making a mistake, they may overreact. They may overreact. Uh, but Islam teaches us to be more proactive than this. Because we need to know our children need to understand their children what they're going through. Sometimes we don't. Um, like at the time of the companions and even like up to hundred years ago, um, what we call today generation gap did not exist in its full sense. Hmm? Uh, because many children had their own time and space and the parents had their own time and space, but there are always time and space for both. They do things together. If you look at the companions, Umar used to take up in Umar with him to the mosque. Many companions used to take their children to the mosque. And then when they go back, they discuss. And so there is no, what we might call today, generation gap. It's something we created because we created a gap between us and our children. We don't communicate with them. And many children today think that our parents don't understand us. They belong to a different phase. They are people of the past, we are the people of the iPad. And <laughs> and like some children, two years old, they know how to use iPad. I mean, they're, they're born and they know how to use iPad without even looking, or the iPhone. Yeah, so uh, there are the principle, and this principle is in fiqh as well as in, in, a, in uh, the judges use it, also the people in the government use it, people in in the court of law use it, people who are in fatwa use it, people in fuqa use it, and, and everybody can use it. So uh, the principles say in the, in the court of law that if a judge can discipline with the look, he should not use words. And if, so if you can discipline with the look, He should not frown. And if he can discipline with frowning, so if frowning is sufficient, words are not to be used. So if, if the look is sufficient, 
no, but no other body language needs to be used. And you don't overreact. So if the mistake is such that it can be corrected just by look, use that only. But if the mistake is a bit more severe, that it needs more than a look, it needs frowning as well, then you can frown Do to show your displeasure. This assumes, of course, that there is an atmosphere of love and respect between the children and the parents, and the children, they don't want to make their parents angry or, or mad. So if, if they see their parents frowning, they realize that they've done something that they shouldn't do. And it is enough to correct the behavior. If frowning is not sufficient, so if frowning is sufficient, words are not needed. If words are sufficient, grounding is not needed. Because sometimes you say, as soon as a mistake, go to your room, you're grounded for two weeks. Huh? But there's a level. And so if words are sufficient, habits is not needed. Same thing with the colleague, the judge. So if words are sufficient, you don't need to imprison the person, the guilty. Yeah. And if, if grounding is sufficient uh, for one day or one hour or five minutes, or taking something away from the child, uh, then grounding may not be needed. If grounding is needed, for one day, don't ground them for two weeks. So the, the parents need to have a system. And the children need to be aware of that system. So it doesn't come as a surprise. So it, I know some families, they have, they have meetings, family meetings. When I was at university, we had this for the students, he had, there were like 12 children or 13 children, and their father used to be in the police, he was a cop. So their father made, uh, they had weekly meetings or monthly meetings, and he would hold the meeting as if he is a prime minister, and each child is responsible for a ministry. So this guy is for grocery, this guy is for something, this guy is for teaching, this guy is for education. And they would have um, you know, discussions like this, mostly. But I know some people in, here in the West, and, and they have weekly meeting, and they have agenda for the meeting. I imagine they're so organized. I'm not like this, but <laughs> they have agenda for the meeting, and there are points you know, for discussion, and, and they hold meetings as if they're like a board of directors. Uh, and that's how the parents, you know, taught their children from when they were young. I mean, not all parents, you know, need to be like this, but if parents have a system, they need to be proactive, think about it. So, you know, if, if we have children, we should not wait until they're seven or eight, before we develop a system. It needs to take place before that and, and learn like what kind of system would work efficiently. Because what's the purpose of grounding? It's a mean to achieve an end. You want to resolve the situation. So if, if the method you use is not efficient, then we question the you know, the benefit of that message or the efficiency of that mes of that message. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, this this forces uh, like having children forces parents or, or like a household to 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 think to think. Mm -hmm. you know, at the end, every parents are like managers; they have to manage. Mm -hmm. uh, the mother is a manager. The husband is a manager. Even the children, they have to manage themselves. And also manage their relationships with their friends. And when they see something wrong, like I know one, one child, four years, five years old, they came home once and they told their parents that they were deep in thought. So they, they, I think the parents asked the child, what's happening? 
I said, well, I have this friend at school. They're always doing something, and I want to, I, I want to like give them advice, but I don't know how to give advice to them. So, yeah, they were like four or five years old. So they had discussion with the, with the, I mean, I think the girl and the mother had discussion and developed, uh, and gave her some points, and some tips of how to approach the other student. Um, we need to notice these things. Huh? Because the children at a very young age, they're very smart. Hmm? Yeah, they, like when we say, what is the age of responsibility in Sharia? Baalir Ahadir. So Baalir is to be of age. What's the purpose of Bulu to be of age? Purpose is, is to ensure that uh, the the aql taklifi is muktamil, is complete. Because that's the idea, the ana mukallaf, I am responsible. So my intellect has been, is going through the stages of development. When, when I'm born, my intellect is fresh and I start learning. I get to a point where I can distinguish things. I can do things on my own, I can clean myself on my own, I can put my clothes on my own. I and I can judge between things. Uh, so the uh, when something is uh, is not mundabit, it's not precise. The Sharia uses usually um, a parameter. So the parameter we use here, the Sharia used, is um, to reach the age of puberty. Then you become a kind of, So this. Each in the age of puberty is actually a sign, a sign uh, that indicates that this person is now mukallaf, i.e., their intellect has reached the level of taqlid, and it's beyond the intellect of instinct. Because as children, we have instincts like we avoid fire, we, we gravitate toward something that's sweet, uh, but that's like, based on instinct. Our, Intellect has not as yet is going through development. Let's see, akal raizi, akal that is based on instinct, which is many animals have. But there's akal taklifi. This is the minimum akal for taklifi. So it's not required for someone to be Einstein to be responsible. No, if you reach this level, then you are mukallaf. And this level is shared between all the humans on the face of the earth. Now, Sharia is easy like, to pray, to fast, give zakat. Does not require somebody to be have a PhD in nuclear physics. You don't need to. Uh, anybody can do it. And then there is aql. Aql is when you advance more in your intellect. So, uh, for example, to become a mushtari, they require the aql to become. Aqal sawatu sharia, shaped by the sharia. So now we have a layer that of intelligence added to the layer that we had before. Yeah. Does that answer your question? I mean, it's a general answer because it needs to be case by case. Just like make a quick question. Um, question. Uh, first of all, just a comment on what you just were, were mentioning. My, uh, yeah, my son. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah, yeah. You you commented earlier that uh, sometimes children make mistakes, and so mm -hmm. my son took my pen and read, wrote it. Sometimes parents make mistakes. But sometimes parents make mistakes. Well, he, he wrote he wrote <laughs> he took that and he wrote it in my notebook. So. Okay. Oh, I asked about that. Um, I, I just he should, he should add also parents. Make mistakes. Uh, I, I hear that a lot from so, them as well. So then the children have to comment because some children they they comment, you know, like they go to the Islamic school on Sunday and they go back home, they see their parents not praying, they say, well, we learn how to pray yeah, in school. They remind their parents that we should pray. Now I told us. Um, just, just a quick question again about uh, AF forty-seven, um, and, and maybe this is embedded in the idea of sarcasm. But again, from sort of my my layman's perspective, 
when when I read this ayah, it almost seems like the rationale is being used as an excuse just not to give, right? And almost like there is no there is no intellectual rigor being used here. They're not trying to make a very strong argument. They just are trying to blow off the the you know the the advice. I, I don't know if maybe you can comment on this. Yeah, yeah. They're mocking, they're they're being sarcastic. They don't mean what they say. Because everything is driven by arrogance. But this can be can also be said by people who are not arrogant. It can be said by people who are stingy. Mm -hmm. People may say, you know what, I worked all my life and I exercised the means, I studied, I worked hard, and all of a sudden I gave me tawfiq. So why doesn't this person do the same? Why doesn't why why don't they or why don't they you know find uh, uh, something to do, and maybe Allah Subhanahu will give them tawfiq like he gave me. He may use this argument. Hmm. But this argument is also uh, doesn't stand in Sharia. Because Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala, at the end, he, if, if people are negligent and if there is something they could do and they didn't do, that's part of their negligence. Hmm. Same thing with with, uh, with knowledge, like we are created uh, as children, we know nothing. Allah akhrajakum min utuni ummahatikum la ta'lamun shay. You brought out of the wombs of your mothers knowing nothing. But wajala lakum sama wal absara wal afil. La'allakum tashkur. But he gave you hearing, sight, and heart. These are the windows, these are the tools of knowledge. Because sight here is referring to experiments. So you can experiment. Hearing is referring to reports. You hear reports. And afida is referring to intellect, reason, thinking. So basically, experiment, observing experimentation, reports. And that's how we learn. In school, it's all reports. Well, this book says this, and this book says this. You're not experimenting yourself. Once you reach a certain point, you start doing the experimentation yourself. So the Rama will tell you, ignorance in the beginning is excused. But to remain ignorant is negligence, is out of negligence. And ignorance is not an excuse not to practice Sharia. So ignorance is a bliss in some cases, but not in all cases. And same thing here. Same thing, and, and uh, if, uh, if, if if people don't exercise the means out of negligence, yeah, that's they're being negligent. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala will, will take them, will ask them about this. Uh, but um, like everything being equal, uh, there is a divine plan to to have all of us different. We're not the same. We're, we're the same in, in, in front of the law, in front of the Sharia. But when now this Kullun, we are certainly ma khuliqala. As the Salaf says, everybody is, things made easy for whatever you created for. Allah SWT gave, you, gave us the qualities and attributes and skills and that matches um, you know, our abilities and what we created for. And some of us are very. And from the beginning, we like painting. Some of them, we like putting things together. They are handymen. They are very good at doing things by hand. Some of us, no, we like to add one plus one equal two. So we're good at uh, <coughs> in mathematics or physics or these things. People are different. They have different abilities, different skills. So these are all gifts. If we use these gifts, now we we can achieve what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you know, uh, with the tawfiq of Allah but what we're meant to achieve. Allahumma ajma'na alayk wa tawakna alayk wa la tajhal hawaijana illa ilayk. Allahumma la tufarib jama'na hadha illa bi dhambi maghfur wa amalim maghfur wa tijaratin lan tabur. Allahumma raddina wa rda'anna ya Allah wa kareem. Wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammadin nabiyyidhu umiyyid qayyid.
وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم